thank you very much for joining the last session and thank you for uh for staying on for what's been a, a very information intense morning um i know everyone's going to come out of this with a little bit with something that they can they can take into their their farms or professions moving forward whether it's uh looking at your cull cows in a different way or thinking about autumn pasture and response after a, a dry summer so hopefully uh we can we can find a little a few more practices to take home uh in our final session and and uh and yeah we can improve some some uh productivity around the riverina with it so i'm going to introduce erin strengths now erin is an honors student if you wouldn't mind turning on your video please erin Excellent, good to see you. Uh, so Erin's an honours student at, at Charles Sturt University who's doing a project which is a little bit different to what some of our, our production focused honours students have been doing recently, but I think it's a really important cause and, and hope, I'm, I'm really hoping we get some positive outcomes about, uh, about how farmers and, and vegans potentially have similar views. So I'll hand over to you, Erin, and I will bring up your slides now. Perfect, thank you. Not a problem. Okay, so understanding the shared values between vegans and livestock producers in Australia. That's the title of my research. And when I tend to tell people the title, they think, they say, ah, interesting, or are you a vegan? And I'm sure that some of you might be thinking the same. So just to clarify, I'm a keen omnivore with a curious nature and an interest in market research. So shared values. I'm looking at the shared values between livestock producers and vegans. So you might think that there might not be any, but I believe that there are. And I believe that there is a better way to view the situation between livestock producers and vegans. I believe that we can facilitate positive and productive conversations for change and innovation. So what do I mean by shared values? Well, I'm currently conducting my research so I'll share a link at the end if you would like to get involved. But I can already see overlaps in an animal welfare concern, a want for progress and innovation, lessening environmental impact, and minimizing suffering for animals. So why should this matter to you? Why should this matter to you as livestock producers? Well, we've recently seen a change in the consumer market. A Food Frontier report showed that one in 10 Australians are reducing their meat intake with baby boomers aged 56 to 76 leading this reduction. There's also the economic side. Economically, the plant-based industry in Australia grossed $150 million last year and is expected to increase to $3 billion by 2030. In comparison, the livestock industry grossed approximately 66 billion and provided employment to 400,000 people. So while the plant-based industry has less of an economic significance than the livestock industry, it does show an increase in monetary value awarded to plant-based products by consumers. So what can you gain as a livestock producer sorry, from listening to vegan opinions? Well, as a livestock producer, you rely on social license, which is the approval from consumers to operate. So it's clear to see that there's tension between veganism social license and livestock producer social license. So while veganism social license increases, livestock producer social license tends to decrease. So there's an importance in maintaining or increasing your social license. And through my research of the literature, it's been found that involving all stakeholders in conversations around animal welfare can increase social license. So I'd like to share with you a study looking into meat consumers and animal welfare activism. And I've paraphrased here, but it highlights that as livestock producers, understanding vegan views and opinions might be key to the sustainability of the industry, which is your business, as these might become the majority views of the future. So if you are over 18, vegan or a livestock producer, as I said previously, we would love to hear your opinion. You can find the link here on this slide, um, or if you type in the Graham Centre into your search bar, it's also on their website under understanding shared values between vegans and livestock producers. So that's all for me today. Um, thank you so much for your time. And if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear them.
Thanks so much, Erin. Um, no worries. In the light of time, we might ask anyone who's got interesting questions or, or discussion points just to add those to the chat or the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the the link isn't available in our proceedings, but Erin's email address is. So if you are interested and you can't find uh, contact information, please shoot Erin an email and uh, be sure to get in touch. So I think it's really important as we move forward that you know we start recognising these people. Bruce, I can see you waving your... I don't know what it is. Is it the world's best presenter award or not quite? <laughs> Excellent. Look, I'll thank you very much, Erin. Uh, I'll, I'll no hand worries. over to Bruce now to, to give a, a, a quick announcement. Yeah, thanks very much, Tom. Can you hear me there now, Tom? I can, thank you. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And I, I can't, I can't work um, videos. So what I was trying to show was that this was um, the annual Graham uh, Centre Beef Field Day 2009, and I just wanted to um, indicate to all um, listeners um, that the Graham Centre uh, livestock forums have been going in one form or another since they were started in 2009 by two people. One of them was Jan Levart, um, who came up with the original idea and the instigator and mover behind it all has been Tony Nugent. And I just want to recognise Tony's contribution uh, over the last 12 years to specifically this livestock forum. Uh, changes at CSU may mean, I'm not 100% sure on this, but Tony uh, won't be with us in future. And if that's the case, it's a, a, a sad day, but it, it may be that she's with us in another form. Uh, but I just want to recognise Tony's contribution. Without Tony, the uh, livestock forums, the field days that we've had would not have occurred. We started in 2009 with the inaugural uh, cattle uh, day, um, which Tony and, and Jan um, uh, initiated, and I was uh, one of the people involved. The only reason I'm, I'm saying this is I think I'm the only person here that's been involved from the word go that, that's still involved at the moment, uh, along with Tony. So um, the, the thing I really want to highlight, and Tony, can you un, uh, pop your camera on for me, please, and your mic? Um, that there are three words I've just written down here. Uh, one is enthusiasm, one is effervescence, and the other is energy. Um, Tony just brings those three things to us. The number of meetings, I, I think Jim Vergona and I hold the um, prize for never having submitted anything on time to Tony, and she still <laughs> smiles at us and encourages us and includes us, despite the frustration. So thanks, Jim, for helping me with that. Um, and Tony, your contribution uh, to the Graham Centre overall is separate, but to this livestock forums has just been invaluable. So um, I just want to acknowledge that, and I'm just going to hand over to Lee to uh, say a couple of words too. So thank you, Tony. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. I, I'm not sure if if people can hear me. Just... Yeah, we can, Lee. Uh, uh, excellent. I, I can't seem to get my camera to work for some reason. Um, but Tony, I, I just wanted to add to, to Bruce's words there. Um, my understanding is that the Livestock Forum has been going since 2009, um, and in that time it's become a, a real flagship event for the Graham Centre, and it's reached thousands of people, and that uh, impact is really important for us. The opportunity for our researchers to engage with the industry is also really important. and. That opportunity has come about through your hard work and dedication. And I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you for your time and efforts in making this forum possible. Certainly 2020 hasn't been without a challenge. And I think you've really risen to the occasion in, in creating an online forum for us to continue this really important event. I'm really hopeful that we can continue some form of association with you in the future. Uh, we, we don't obviously know what that future will look like at this point, but again, I extend a heartfelt thank you to you on behalf of all of Graham Centre members. Um, and I really hope that um, you understand and appreciate from our perspective, the important role that you have had in creating this event. Tony, I wish you the best in the future. And uh, I really look forward to to seeing how we can continue to work together as a, as a team in some way. So good luck for, for the rest. 
That, thanks, Lee, and, and I certainly should have said that we wouldn't have had a forum this year at all if it hadn't been for Tony's insistence that we could do it and bigger and better than ever. I've just looked on the participants list. We're, we're over 120 people again, which we've consistently got. The only thing I think we're really going to miss this year is um, I'm not sure Tony's got questions at the end where she gives you the answers. Um, it's been one of the highlights of the Graham Centre is filling out the survey at the end, and if you're not sure about which box to to tick. Tony always tells you which box to tick. So that, that's typical of her enthusiasm in making sure she gets a response. She's introduced all sorts of things to us, clickers we've had, and now we've got this online thing. And there's, there's, um, I can absolutely assure you that while Tony might be with us at the Graham Centre, she'll be with us in agriculture. Uh, you can't keep a good person down. It's just fantastic to work with you, Tony. So I've wrecked up your agenda. I'm sorry, but we just thought we'd throw that in there. So I'll mute myself and you can now carry on with the rest of the conference. Thank you, Tony. Okay, so that was really out of the blue. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks very much. I'm going to actually just hand back to Tom to continue the conversation and we will be having questions at the end. Um, but yeah, I just won't be prompting you. But you know, in advance, um, the, the right answers are that it was extremely relevant and it's very valuable and you will be implementing <laughs> changes on farms. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'll hand back to Tom and we'll get on with the rest of the day. All right, well, that was a breath of fresh air. We needed that. Um, thank you very much, Tony. Um, let's get on with our final session and I might just uh, invite all of the speakers for the final session to quickly pop up. So. Colin, John and Brent, if you could please turn on your videos again. Uh, so Brent's going to give us a, a, a presentation and then for the remainder of the hour, we are going to be uh, pinning out our panel with some, some tough and easy questions, hopefully. So Colin, I'm just waiting on yours to initialize. It looks like it's coming up. John, I can see you in the jungle there, which is good. I haven't seen Brent yet. Um, I also wanted to add we had some apologies, so sorry if I'm repeating this, but um, we had some technical difficulties from, from one person uh, and we've had uh, someone have to disappear very quickly. So our three panel guests will be stuck with the brunt of the questions this afternoon. Um, look, John, you're, you're up and available right now. If you wouldn't mind giving just a, a, a three sentence introduction to, to what you do and, and why you're here, uh, that'd be excellent. Uh, I work for New South Wales DPI in livestock nutrition research and forage conservation. Um, I'm essentially here because unfortunately Greg Condon wasn't able to make the day, so I'm your backup. So please be gentle and don't ask too many hard questions. Oh, I've been writing hard ones down already. <laughs> now, uh, here we go. Excellent. So we still haven't got cold, but that's all right. Brent, I can see you now. How are we this morning or this afternoon? Yeah, well, thanks, Tom. Excellent. I can hear you. And if you wouldn't mind giving just a very quick intro to yourself, and then I'll hand over to you uh, with your slides. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, look, I, I'm a farmer down at uh, Lockhart uh, and uh, joining today to talk about uh, the, the magic of, uh, of mixed cover uh, uh, species crops. So Perfect. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, look, Colin, hopefully uh, we can fix his technical difficulties and we'll get him back on very shortly. Uh, Let's hand over to you, Brent, and uh, and yeah, please take us through your presentation. Lovely, thanks, Tom. Um, look, I've called it uh, mixed species magic, but my uh, talk today, uh, because I, I truly believe there is something magic that happens when you combine all these plants together. Um, it just seems to be a, a great package. Um, I thought I'd give a little bit of background about how we uh, how we first got into it. Uh, we're a mixed farm, cropping uh, 2,500 hectares and running sheep on the remaining 750 hectares. Um, we started uh, probably six or seven years ago down this track. Uh, initially, it began, we, um, we started to head down the total cropping road. Um, we ran into troubles with ryegrass resistance and, uh, and just uh, falling nitrogen levels. So we started looking at uh, vetch and started using it as a green manure. Um, the vetch grew quite well and uh, it gave us plenty of dry matter production, uh, some nitrogen, and also gave us a, uh, a weed hit by using uh, Roundup and, um, and Gramoxone in the springtime. 
the the problem with it was um, we we found there was not much uh, production coming off it apart from uh, from those. So we thought we'd add sheep back into it, and uh, we've started increasing our uh, our sheep numbers since then. Um, prior to the vetch, we, we were using pulse crops uh, to provide those things, but we found there was a bit of a roller coaster with the pulse crops um, with returns. So hence we went to the vetch and, and found uh, a lot more solid returns coming from the livestock. So from the vetch, we progressed to, um, to adding grazing wheat to the mix. Initially, that was because the vetch was reasonably slow in the autumn. It had prolific growth late winter and in the spring. We felt we were missing a little bit to begin with. So we added uh, grazing wheats. Um, we started... Um, with some of the earlier ones and have progressed to Kitty Hawk now. Um, so that, that was our first uh, look into, uh, into mixing the species. And then um, after talking to our agronomist, Greg Condon, he recommended trying to uh, add some tillage radish and some purple top turnip into the mix. Um, sorry, I'll just move on to the next screen. Um, and that, that was where our love affair with the mixed species really began. Uh, so at the moment, what we're running is at 400 hectares of permanent pasture, and it uh, comprises uh, loosened clovers in some mixes, and on the heavier uh, sodic country, we go to a, uh, a phalaris clover mix, and then we have about 350 hectares of, uh, of mixed species uh, cover crops that uh, complement the permanent pasture. Basic mixes um, will be a grazing wheat at 30 kilos, uh, a vetch at 30 kilos, radish at about two, and turnip at half a kilo. Um, we've since progressed to, uh, to adding a 12-way mix to it. Uh, the 12-way mix we're picking up from uh, a guy called uh, Grant Sims down at Chukri, he runs down under covers down there. And uh, we're finding that the 12-way mix is actually uh, adding a lot more diversity to the mix as well. If you have a look at this photo up in the, uh, in the top left, that's actually a cover crop from uh, from last year. We only had um, 190 mils of uh, growing season rainfall. And in the springtime, our dry matter production there peaked at, uh, at 12 tonne to the hectare, which we were quite amazed at. Um, to complement the, uh, the mixed species, we've also um, had some dual purpose crops by their own. Uh, initially, we started off just having grazing wheat or uh, grazing canola as a monoculture. Uh, we've since started adding um, companion crops to the mix. That um, has really made a big difference to the monocultures. It's um, certainly improved um, the livestock health and also the growth from the, uh, from, the dual, uh, from the dual purpose crops. So some of the mixes we have in this year, um, kitty hawk wheat with tillage radish, uh, the wheat with the vetch, three away mix with wheat, vetch, and 970 canola, and also some manna soach and vetch. Uh, these are pictures here taken uh, up in the top left probably a month ago, and that's showing some of the growth of the vetch and oats. And the one down on the right is the, the three way mix with the wheat, vetch, and, uh, and the 970 canola. Um, what our plans are with the dual purpose crops is um, we'll start terminating the companion crops um, in the next few weeks. We've actually done some already and we'll take um, the pure wheat crop through to harvest or the, uh, or the grazing canola through to harvest and just terminate the covers. One of the magical things um, with these mixed species is, um, is the fact that we um, haven't had to use fertilizer and herbicides. Uh, I was encouraged after reading a, a book by Gabe Brown um, called, uh, called Dirt to Soil, and uh, he's really reduced his uh, inputs. We uh, tried it about two or three years ago, removing fertilizer from it, uh, and haven't used herbicides on the mixed species crops at all. There seems to be um, sort of some sort of synergistic um, reaction happening between the plants. Um, the tillage radish in particular is uh, supposed to bring up uh, phosphorus from the deep down in the soil and obviously the, uh, the nitrogen, nitrogen is being supplied from the vetch uh, and we've 
those growth rates uh, that I talked about uh, in that previous slide of, of 12 tonne of the hectare was with uh, zero herbicide, uh, zero fertiliser, I'm sorry. Uh, we've also tried to cut out fungicide and insecticides on the mixed species. Uh, we're still using a little bit of fertiliser with, um, with the dual purpose crops. So at the moment, uh, that comprises 20 kilos of MOP at sowing and, uh, and no further nitrogen added to it. I'm pretty keen to, uh, to experiment with some summer, summer covers. At the moment, we've only done uh, winter covers. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm struggling with a little bit. Uh, there's conflicting information on the summer covers. Um, the, uh, the, the work in the Northern Hemisphere seems to say that you're, uh, you're retaining more moisture by having the, uh, the green plants over the top and protecting the soil from the sunlight. But uh, some of the evidence from people that have tried it in Australia here they're finding that the uh, the use of the moisture is making it difficult for crop establishment the following year. Um, I, this year, I'm uh, as I said, planning to try it. I think I'll start with uh, crops that are intended for uh, winter covers next year. So we'll go into a summer cover, followed by a winter cover, and then into uh, into cropping in uh, in 2022. Utilisation of the uh, other cover crops is certainly difficult. Um, we find we have uh, enormous amounts of feed in the winter and early spring, um, but then we're uh, we're terminating the covers sort of mid to late spring. So that means we uh, we're having tight feed issues early in the year, and uh, and then tight again late spring before uh, stubble country comes on board. Um, some of the ways we've uh, tried to help with the utilisation is we've employed the Kiwi Tech uh, electric fencing system. Uh, you can see up the top here, we've got it mounted on a quad. Uh, it's, it's quite quick to put out. Uh, and there's an electronic um, uh, motors there that wind it up when you're picking it up. So it's, uh, it's quite good and you can actually maintain grazing pressure in certain parts of the paddock, uh, which helps with, uh, with maintaining the grazing. This year we've kept back our, um, our weather lambs uh, as wool cutters. We run a uh, merino based system. And although the, the wool uh, price has um, taken a drop in the last few months, um, we're still prepared to take the, these wool cutters through. We just think they're going to give us some flexibility. So in the tougher years when our grazing crops aren't producing quite as much, um, they give a, a pressure relief valve and that we can, uh, we can quickly sell them into the market. Uh, other, other ways of utilising this extra feed are reducement. Uh, whilst we haven't taken much on ourselves, plenty of neighbours have been using adjustment this year, particularly with um, the tight conditions up in the Monero. Um, we also used hay cuts as well to utilise that bulk of feed in the springtime. Um, yeah, look, it is a challenge utilising all that feed uh, when it comes at certain times and being an annual, um, but th there are ways of working through it. Um, some of the things in the future that we're intending on doing um, is the Shelbourne stripper front, but I guess before I start there, we, we actually went to a disc system here up on the left-hand side with an XL. Um, we find this really dovetails nicely with the, um, with the mixed cover species. You can uh, go in early uh, when there's limited moisture um, and get those cover crops up and away quickly. You can leave uh, plenty of cover on the ground, which means that moisture is he um, held in the ground, and you can really make use of, uh, of any late summer, early autumn rainfall. I think the, the second part of the package is the stripper front. We have one ordered for this harvest. Just means we can uh, have a lot bigger stubbles and retain more straw on top of the ground without mulching it through the header. And it's just giving us a lot better moisture, uh, holding capacity and, uh, and that ability to sow early. Uh, with some of the utilisation, uh, we're having trouble with water for sheep. So um, that's probably a big thing we need to work on at the moment. The, the Kiwi Tech works well during the winter and uh, early spring when water isn't an issue. Uh, but over summertime, we really need to work on, uh, on watering points to, uh, to help make that uh, even grazing possible.
This is just a couple of photos. Um, the young fella that works for us, Archie, here on the left in the 12A uh, mix this year. Uh, I think you've seen the vetch and the oats and the three-way mix there. Um, that three-way mix is actually uh, something we harvested last year just to help um, keep the um, cost of seed down a bit. It was uh, quite easy to harvest, um, put it through the grader, clean it up, and um, and just sowed it straight off the uh, off the grader into the uh, into the paddock. So there are certainly ways of um, of keeping the uh, the cost down on it. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the questions I had uh, over the years was. Uh, any uh, issues we've had with um, with these mixed species grazing crops? And look, up until this year, I couldn't really find any. Uh, but we have had this year with um, our ewes getting very heavy uh, with the prolific growth, and then their feet not drying out with the wet, which uh, has led to a lot of foot scald and um, yeah, has really affected our lambing this year. So look, there there is a downside to them, but uh, very limited. So look, I. I think uh, now, Tony, we might, uh, uh, Tom, sorry, we might hand over to, uh, to questions. That's reasonably um, sort of a, a nutshell of what uh, what we're doing here with the with the mixed species. Absolutely, thanks so much, Brent. I, uh, it's great to to see some some good green paddocks. Um, I, I might try. I might invite John and Colin to also turn on their cameras. And while we're waiting for them, I will just remind everyone to get over into the Q&A section and ask any questions you might, may have for, for Brent, uh, John or Colin. I'm hoping Colin pops up because I have some questions targeted him with his, uh, his summer, summer cover crop research. Oh, it looks like we are on. Colin, good to see you. Excellent. So, um, look, I think... Now that I've I've led into that, I might I might start there and say, um, look, Brent Brent said that he'd read some conflicting uh, outcomes from the summer cover crops. I know you're you're working in that area, um, so can you give us a little bit of a, a little bit of a rundown on some of the experience you've got with with the summer covers? Yeah, yeah, sure, Tom. Um, so yeah, we've been looking at some summer cover cropping uh, only over the last two years. Um, yeah, what we've been finding effectively is growing that biomass over the summer period, it actually utilises moisture to grow that actual biomass. So we're certainly depleting soil moisture levels to grow the biomass. But then the real question is, by having that increased level of ground cover, are we going to, are we going to be more effective at capturing that soil water over that fallow period? So, um, yeah, so we used water uh, after the first rainfall event. So we're around 50 to 60 millimetres a soil water deficit once we sprayed out the various cover crops. Um, but the interesting thing was that after the first rainfall event, we could actually catch up quite quickly with, within our soil water levels. So yes, we did use moisture to grow the, the various covers, but the soil water recharge was certainly a lot quicker compared to a bare ground. And, and particularly after the first rainfall event, so it was quite a steep curve um, up, to actually recharge. But after the various rainfall events since then, we haven't overtaken, if, if that makes any sense. So yeah, the recharge was quick to start with, but it seems to be tracking very similar since. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, John, Brent, did you have anything to, to add to that? No, happy with that? No worries. Uh, yeah, no, just, like... just one, Tom. Yep, go for it, Brent. Yeah, Cole, so you were terminating those um, summer covers before they went to seed? Yeah, correct, Brent. So we were actually, we had three different spray out timings. So we had a 50 days after sowing, an 80 days after sowing, and 110 days after sowing the actual various cover crops. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we had it at three different timings. So the, the longer we let the covers grow, the more moisture it actually just used up. But then from a grain perspective, the earlier we just wanted to grow quick biomass and spray it out quickly. If, you, if your goalpost is purely on grain yield, um, we didn't want those covers in there for too long. But from a mixed farming perspective, from a, a forage perspective, the longer we had the covers growing, the more grazing value you could actually get from those covers. And probably another important part of it is as well, the longer you've got a cover growing, you're also utilising that nitrogen. So we're taking up nitrogen, grow that, that bulk, 
And so there could be a bit of a nitrogen deficit for the following cash crop. Thanks, Colin. Um, we might jump on on our our soil nutrient status from there. We've got a question from Jeff Casburn, um, who's angled uh, targeted this one at you, Brent. But I think we can open it up. Uh, he's asked, "Have you been monitoring your soil P status in the paddocks where you're not applying any?" No, look, I haven't actually, Tom. Um, so yeah, look, it'll be interesting to have a look at that. Yep, and and Colin, I guess in your your line of work, have you have you looked at this at all, or have you seen any? Yeah, any we, with it? we've we've had a bit of a look at it with with summer weeds and also with this, and couldn't pick anything up with with our phosphorus, but we certainly could with with the mineral nitrogen was the one that we really could see big differences in. But we haven't been doing it long enough to probably pick up the differences within the phosphorus. Thank you. John, you look like you're looking off into the distance there. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna put that one to you. Um, we'll we'll move on again uh, to another another plant based side of it. We'll go with Jeff again here, which is how have uh, you been dealing with your ryegrass resistance within your system? And Brent, that one was directed. Um, that's back to me. I'm assuming Tom. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah. Look, Various tools. We um, we're mixing up our um, herbicides and our rotations, which most people are doing. Um, the hay cutting is a, is a big part of our program. So um, if we uh, if we see ryegrass in uh, particularly in the cereal crops, um, we'll cut patches or or entire paddocks to uh, to attack it. We just feel we need something different um, besides herbicides to try and uh, uh, fix the problem. Uh, we've been spraying. Um, with a uh, with a sprayer underneath the windrower um, to tidy up uh, canola stubbles, that's uh, another tool in the in the box, and uh, and the livestock play a big real role, of course. Um, so if we uh, if we're following one of these um, cover crops, we'll go with um, Roundup followed by Gramoxone, followed by grazing from the sheep. So we're really having a um, a triple knock effect, which uh, which seems to be doing a good job. Thanks, Brent. Um, Colin, anything to add to that? Oh, I don't think so, to be honest with you, Thomas. Okay. No. no, that's good. Um, we can continue on then. Look, uh, we've got a few more coming in now, so thank you, everyone. Um, we might jump over to the animal side of it. Uh, a question from Michael, which I actually had jotted down as a preloaded question, so <laughs> which is good. Good to know great minds think alike. Uh, Thinking along the lines of Fred Provenza, who's a researcher from the States who uh, has some pretty unique theories, um, do we see any animal health benefits from using these multi-species pastures? And I know, Brent, you've, you've spoken about this previously, sort of the health aspect and the production aspect of the livestock in your system. Yeah, mine's purely anecdotal, but um, we just seem to have good performance from the animals and uh, we uh, over the years when we've had straight grazing crops, um, the sheep have been quite loose and um, daggy, but um, we just don't seem to see it anymore on the mixed species. They seem to be staying clean all winter. It'd be interesting to do some broad scale work on that. John, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I might just say that um, that that whole concept that Fred talks about is a thing called nutritional wisdom, which essentially says that animals will select a diet that that is better for them. So if they've got the choice that they will not just eat a cereal, for example, they'll eat a range of different pasture species to, to get a more complete diet. Um, th there's certainly um, people who, who have seen it and um, unfortunately though it's a little bit hard to quantify or, or um, measure what sort of impact that is. Um, it, it's obviously logical though in the sense that uh, we know a lot of crops like cereals are deficient in particularly some of the minerals. Um, the the only potential side or side effect might be that um, there's, while there might be capacity for animals to select a better diet, let's not forget that they also select the more palatable diet. So. You, you can run the risk with some mixes that animals will selectively graze out one of the species at the, at the expense of others because they um, just prefer them. But there's certainly no nutritional reason not to have them as a mix, and there may be advantages. 
Thanks, John. Um, all right, let's continue on. So we've got Gordon Refshorgi here from uh, Cowra. Uh, Brent, uh, John, there's a there's a comment for you there from from Professor Bruce, Bruce Orwell. Uh, <laughs> look, Brent, does the the clover have any presence? Uh, does clover have any presence in your twelve species mix? And if it does, what clover are you using? Um, yes, it's, uh, it does. Um, to be honest, I don't know. There's about three different clovers in that um, down undercover mix. Um, and yes, there are clovers. The clover in general for us has struggled in a pasture phase over the last probably 10 or 15 years. Once upon a time, clover was uh, the mainstay of our, uh, our pasture rotation, but it's really seemed to have struggled uh, competing with the perennial plants in the system. Yeah, thank you. And Colin, would you like to add anything to that? Have you worked with uh, with clovers in in your mixed system? No, we haven't. So within our, so I'm sort of coming a bit more from a, a cropping perspective with our our mixed species. But uh, I suppose our our the interesting thing with the mixed species is that every plant has a role. I suppose so we ended up selecting millet and sorghum to try and grow our biomass, and then we were using cowpeas and lab lab to try and fix fix nitrogen and then our tillage radish and sunflowers to do a bit of a deep ripping effect. So um, that was the, the logic behind the kind of mixes that we went with. Thanks, Colin. Uh, let's see, where are we up to? We've got Rita Bowler, who is asking if, Brent, do you, are you regularly keeping an eye on, uh, on your soils? Are you doing soil testing? Yes, we, um, we normally test before we come into a rotation. Um, so yeah. We'll yep. um, at the end of the cover crop phase, we'll go, we'll test, and then come into with, with canola and start the uh, the cropping rotation again. Then, thank you. And does that does that dictate any of your decisions, or is it more just about the inputs that you've got to put in? Mostly about monitoring. Yeah. Um, but particularly, um, we uh, we're heavily acidic here, and we also tend down to some sodic country down towards Huron Creek. So, um, yeah, we're looking at uh, lime and gypsum applications in particular. Cool, thank you. Uh, we've got Tracy Bird Gardener here, uh, who's asking for the mixed cover crops, has this had any effect on soil microbes and disease levels for, for specific crops? So I might open that one up to you, Colin, to start off with. Yeah, um, look, certainly, uh... The, the trial that we're actually got in the ground at the moment, we're actually doing predictor bees on. So we're actually looking at those carryovers as far as from a disease perspective. But uh, you would, yes, yeah, so we haven't got all the results in on that yet. But um, yeah, we're certainly looking into that particular mm -hmm. space because you'd expect that there would be. Thank you. And uh, Brent, anything anecdotally that you're seeing in your system in terms of uh, disease? And yeah, look, um, yeah. Um, look, it's probably just on general crop health and performance. Um, as I said, we put canola onto this uh, onto the cover crops once we've um, fallowed them in the in the springtime, and we've had uh, two pretty tough springs in um, nineteen and eighteen, and we've harvested um, profitable canola crops off the cover crops. Um, so there's something going on. I mean, a lot of it's probably to do with stored stored moisture, um, but it virtually guarantees us a, a canola crop in in a 500 mil rainfall um, bracket that uh, that we would struggle to get uh, off of, say, a wheat stubble over these last couple of tough springs. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess moving into that production side of it, um, Jeff's asking here, how does how do these systems play on uh, on grain yield? What Are there any impacts on grain yield that you, you're observing? We might go to you, Colin, first with your with the last two years of work. Yeah, yeah, sure. So just keep it in perspective of what the last two years have been like I suppose, in, in, <laughs> in central New South Wales. But yeah, look, the, the grain yield was severely hit. Um, uh, last year, we ended up losing about one and a half tonnes to the hectare at, at the Canoundra site um, where we were growing the cover crops, particularly when the cover crop was grown out longer. So the yield losses were less if we sprayed it out earlier. And the park site was pretty much a wipeout. So where we had a, a cover crop in, you know, around you know, 0.2 tonne to the hectare, like a couple of bags to the acre, basically. Um, it would to compared to the fallow was, you know, only around 0.6 tonne to the hectare. So 
yeah, right. Parks was a bit of a wipeout. Um, but on Canoundra, yeah, we did get a you know one and a half ton of the hectare yield hit yield penalty. And how are you looking this year? Yeah, it's it's, yeah, well, it's certainly a lot better. So it's going to be really interesting because we're looking at the second year legacy effect of that cover crop. So we ended up very similar to Brent. We ended up growing about I think it was around ten to eleven ton of biomass over the summer period. And yes, yeah, so it'll be interesting. So last year we got a one and a half ton to the hectare yield penalty. It'll be interesting. We've got canola in there this year to see what the canola does, whether it starts to to level out now. So, which I suspect that it will. So all your work with summer cover. Oh. Yeah, it is Brent. So it's, it, that's that's right. It's all been with summer covers. Looking at both a, a short fallow and then a long fallow scenario for the guys further west. Yep. And Brent, what what have you? What are your thoughts on sort of the the uh, the cropping side of it in terms of yields? Are you, you're obviously pretty keen on it all, and you're not looking to get away from the mixed cropping or the mixed pastures anytime soon. No, look, the with the we use them in the winter. Yep. Which gives us a um, a fallow period, sort of from late spring right through the, the entire summer. And look, that that has worked really well um, on crop yields. And that's why I was keen just to experiment with some summer, summer covers and just see what happened, whether I'm going to chew too much soil moisture or not. So, yeah, no worries at all with the winter covers, but, yeah, still questioning the summers. Thanks, Brent. Uh, just looking through our questions here, we've got one from Bing Wang, so we know it'll be loaded. Uh, <laughs> John knows Bing well. Uh, I'd like to address this one to you, John, uh, and maybe Michael Campbell will have some reading. He can put some comments in the chat. Uh, so we've got a question. What are the nutritional strategies that might help beef meat quality, question mark, production? So I think we can open that up to sheep as well uh, in terms of, so things looking at it from a, a production outcomes or meat quality outcome um, phase using, yeah, using yeah. these mixed strategies. Right. Look, I, I honestly don't have any research that's had had the long-term view to saying if animals are grazing on mixed pasture, whether it affects meat quality. Someone might know of it, but I'm not aware of it. Um, the, there's, the research I've seen is more along the lines of um, the production from mixed pastures, which aligns itself to that nutritional wisdom, selecting a better diet and a healthier diet, if you, if, if you want to refer to it that way. Um, Look, I, yeah, I re you'd really want to talk to a meat person to find out, but uh, I'm not sure how how a mixed diet would have much of an impact on meat quality as opposed to the yield and, and the growth rate and all those other characteristics of, you know, if the animals grow quickly, they grow faster, you're younger when you're slaughtered and all the rest of it. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I, I'll just... Add to that, uh, Michael, if you're hanging around, if you drop drop some comments in, we can readdress that question for Bing. Um, I, I'm sure he's got some opinions on, on that. I think he's been working in that sort of area quite a lot. Thanks. No, I must admit, Tom, the, the adage about salt bush lamb probably isn't far from the truth because it often does taste pretty good if it comes from out west, having been out there before. Can, can I also yeah. go back and make another comment about the summer cropping thing? Um, and as a non-agronomist, it, 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 it's raised the whole issue about conserving moisture and, and for subsequent crops next year. But, and um, there's no, you know, from what I've seen and what others have told me, there's no doubt that it has an impact. But ultimately, we probably need to do some research or, or at least some work, work where we... Where have, we evaluate that from an economic point of view so that if we grow a summer forage uh, summer cover crop uh, what are the net benefits of doing that in terms of feeding stock and growth rates and things compared to any losses that might be incurred later on from wheat yield so you know if a half a ton wheat yield is more than offset by increased land production um, the, I think ultimately we need to start looking at questions like that mm. And there's also the suggestion that that uh, you you can use that as a bit of a weed management tool as well by competing with summer weeds by putting in a, a vigorous summer crop. Thanks, John. I might open that statement up to see if there's any 
uh, additions, Cole? Do you have any yeah, no, I think you're right, Pilty, spot on. So um, when this whole summer cover cropping project came up, I thought, oh, gee, too risky. It's going to really uh, destroy our, our grain yield. And some of the local growers around here said, oh, but what, what's the value of that forage within a mixed farming system? And and you're right, like it's, it's completely, the value of the forage is actually uh, overcompensated for our grain yield losses, if that makes sense. So as far as uh, spreading risk over the business, um, it's been highly useful, even though we've had a grain yield hit. Yeah, thanks. There's also a cost to, um, also a cost to maintaining those summer fellows, fellows too. Mm. Um, you know, some, if, particularly if we have rain over the summer, we're, we're spraying them two or three times to, uh, to conserve that moisture. So there's a mm. fair economic saving there as well. Mm. Just a, an observation with the comparing a summer cover crop to a summer weed. Uh, we know that summer weeds are really bad from a grain yield perspective, but with, with a summer weed, you get a lot, you, you know, you'll get patches of it grow compared to when you're putting a, a summer cover crop in, you're getting an even, well, hopefully you're getting an even establishment that can grow quite quickly to give you that. So you're getting benefits from what like you're actually growing ground cover compared to a summer weed. You're really not, you've got a lot of bare ground still, so you're not getting any benefits from it. I, I think you need to go and talk to, to the, the gardeners at, at CSU where they've recently installed <laughs> <laughs> a summer weed section there. I don't know if you've driven past it recently. But All right. We'll leave that one as a comment. Look, I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess uh, a question for me, and there's a few more coming too. So, uh, the, you talk about risk and mitigating risk a little bit, um, and I know Brent in previous in previous discussions with you, you sort of mentioned it before that you know bringing livestock back into the system is potentially sort of mitigating a little bit of that risk. Um, do you what do we see moving forward in this space? Do we see more farmers taking it on, sole croppers moving into uh, bringing livestock back into systems, or do we think these are two very different enterprises that are still going to remain? I might leave that to you yeah, that's Brent, good. for first-hand experience. Yeah, look, that's a very good question, Tom. Um, look, I have a feeling that the uh, the total croppers will probably stick with what they're doing. Um, the only thing I have noticed is that uh, quite a few of the total croppers are going to, say, vetch, um, to use it as a green manure or field peas, uh, and they're growing them as a monoculture. And I think they would be... Um, a big, big, a big advantage for them to, to add some mixed species, even if they don't want sheep. And I think they'll get more growth out of it and uh, they'll have a better result in the long term. Thanks, Brent. And Colin, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think sort of locally around here that it's going to be uh, also the guys that are further work, like in a long fallow scenario, like trying to grow some of these cover crops to try and grow some cover so I can get through that long fallow period so they're not bare ground by the by the end of it. So, um, yeah, that's a, sort of another application for, for that. Yep. Uh, all right. So we've got a couple more from Jeff here. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for, for being active in the Q&A session. So we've got cereals grow fast in, the, in winter. How are the other species growing from autumn to spring? I'm guessing he's relating to your fallow crops. Uh, any any input on that one? So I don't quite get the question. Sorry, I missed yeah, that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, so if we don't catch it, hopefully we can get some clarification from Jeff. Cereals grow fast in winter. How are the other species growing from autumn to spring? So I guess he's yeah. Uh, is that like a canola, or a winter canola? Is that? Oh, look, uh, we might ask for some further clarification on that one, <laughs> Jeff. I think. But thanks for your input. Look, I, I think I know. Uh, I think Brent, I know where Let's hand it over to you then. Go for it. Yeah. Look, we just found uh, in the mixed species setup that they they seem to bounce off each other, and and something like a vetch will be a little bit slow earlier on. But if you throw these twelve way mixes together, they seem to uh, to be fighting for. Uh, the space and uh yeah it seems to stimulate the whole lot it just i don't know it seems like a package deal for us thanks brett yeah he's just he's just added up filling filling autumn winter feed gap so i guess looking through those two periods um we'll 
continue on, ah, we've got a, a statement here as well saying whole farm analysis, not just paddock scale, is important, which I think we were commenting mm. on. That's a comment on on the uh, discussion from John and Colin earlier. Um, I might pose a question here, Brent. Um, look, I, I mean, we've heard about a lot of the benefits of it, but from a day to day in day to day life, is there any bothers that you've you've come up with with using this system? Um, I know you. I've noticed you. You know, you've had to invest in in this uh, the Kiwi tech, uh, the electric fence system, and things like that. Like, is there anything that sort of is a pet peeve of yours within this system that people uh, should know about? Yeah. Look, the the Kiwi tech is quite easy to put up and down, but it is another job. So um, there's more labour involved, and the sheep certainly need to be trained. Um, you can't just roll it out and, uh, and hope that they'll respect it. Uh, but that's just a matter of holding them in the yards for 24 or 48 hours and, uh, and letting them get close to the fence and touch it and, yeah, get used to it and understand what it is. Um, but, yeah, it is more labour intensive. And, and as I said, the, the first uh, major drama we've had was this year with, um, with feet, um, sheep's feet being constantly wet uh, and with heavy, uh, heavily pregnant ewes. Uh, we did did have trouble with uh, with feet and uh, lambing, so yeah, there's a couple of down downsides, but uh, yeah, far outweighed by the good. Thanks. Can I just add a couple of comments, Tom? Please. Um, just with the mixed species from a summer from a summer mixed species perspective, um, really noticed that when we went to try and sow these crops, you know, we're sowing them late November, early December after harvest. Uh, generally speaking, it's very hot. And like Brent said earlier, like a disc seeder is really, it helps you be able to sow it and not sort of dry the profile out or the seed bed out um, with that. Now with the mixed species, you'll have some species that are really small, like millet that has to be sown really shallow. And then you've got other species like forage sorghum or cow peas that you can put really deep. So you just need to keep in mind, uh, if you've got a lot of your species are targeting like millet that has to be sown shallow, you can't really put it in deeper if that makes sense. So just be aware of seeding depth, I suppose, is the key thing that suits your, your, your mix. Thank you, Cole. So, Pilty, you've gone quiet over there, so I might point, point it at you. Uh, <laughs> is there anything you wanted to add to it from your experiences? I know uh, you may not have quite as direct experience, but any thoughts? I, I, would, I would like to reiterate that whole farm thing, and I'd, I'd chuck a couple of other examples that, that we've noticed here. Um, more recently, we were looking at forage conservation as a, a method of controlling weeds. And what, in one year, back probably four years ago now, where we had a wet summer, we did actually look at growing a, a Japanese millet over um, a, a Japanese millet up at the Graham Centre field site and found that um, in that particular year, the Jap millet was equally effective as Roundup at, at controlling um, witchgrass, hairy panic, whatever you want to call it, um, and and it was effectively a bare, it was effectively not there compared to a bare ground. Um, we did, I think, lose about half a tonne of grain yield um, with one treatment or one more, but we when we did our sums, we certainly worked out that the millet was much better. The land production we got off that was much better. And that's not taking into account things like Brent said about spraying and all the rest of it. The The other um, comment I would make is we've subsequently grown some forage crops where we looked at cutting at sort of early October, late October or November, which is similar, Brent, to you taking off your hay cut. And we found that um, where the successful otherwise that we had with ryegrass was heavily dependent upon the timing. And if we got it off early enough and then controlled the regrowth, we, we substantially depressed ryegrass the following year. However, if we cut it and the seed shattered or we cut it and it regrow and reseeded, um, the impact was much less. So if you're thinking of that as an option within within your farming system, they're just a couple of more recent things that we've noticed here at Wagga. Just to um, to add to that ryegrass issue, um, there's a couple of things we've noticed with the uh, with the winter covers is that a we're normally trying to sow these late February, early March, 
uh, and there's very little ryegrass will germinate at that time of the year. So we uh, we get the covers up and away and they're really competitive. And um, you actually end up, you've got a lot less ryegrass to try and kill in the springtime because these covers have outcompeted them during the year. It would be interesting to see, I don't, I don't know if you've had John Broster out there walking around in your paddocks trying to collect seed, but it would be interesting to see sort of you know, what, what the status of the of your ryegrass is um, sort of moving forward. As, as I said, it's establishing early and being really competitive. So uh, you might, yeah, might be a positive. Uh, well, definitely is a positive, but it'd be interesting to see what John says. Uh, we've got a few more questions coming in, which is great. Uh, Jeff, uh, oh, one, uh, we've got a, I'll call this a comment from Bing, uh, which is talking about uh, the, the risk of red meat uh, consumption and how there, it's, there isn't one. Um, look, if you want to have a look at that one, just read into it. Um, and there's definitely some studies to have a look at if you're interested in, in red meat uh, health and quality. Um, Jeff Casburns asked us a question here. How do you decide on seeding rates between your species? So how do you come up with your mix? Brent, I'll start with you. Yeah, that was um, pretty much on recommendations from Greg Connor, our agronomist. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, and also consulting with um, with the seed resellers. So we um, we bought a bit from uh, AGF and also from um, from Grant Sims, and yeah, just following their recommendations. So it, we seem to be sort of round about that forty to fifty kilos of mix per hectare, and then um, yeah, make up the combination as we go a bit. Yep. Um, and so you are t always tweaking that sort of combination as as time progresses. Yeah, and um, well, as I said, initially we started with one, we, then we went to two, and then we went to four. And this year, for the first time, we've tried the twelve way mix in with ours. So uh, yeah, they they seem to think eight to ten plus is uh, is the ideal for a mixed species. Yep. Uh, um, Cole, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, well, the way that we came up with the seeding rates, we've just got a, the local growers together and we just came up with it, basically. So as far as the seeding rate, how we actually sort of decided it. But um, I suppose just need to keep in mind for ours, the mixed species, it was like 85 bucks a hectare. So we went for the Rolls-Royce of what we were trying to achieve. Um, that's to sort of buy, that's to, to buy the seed. So some of them are, are quite expensive, the seed. Just, just keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, we're actually getting close to being out of time, uh, which is great that we've managed to have plenty of questions coming through and there's a few to get through. So I've got one here from uh, Craig Wilson. It might actually be a statement, but I will read this one out for everyone. Um, the Merino lamb trial measuring biomass and weight gains off mixed species crops at Harefield. Um, weight gains have been excellent at 220 grams per head per day for 12 weeks. Uh, we'll have a net profit per team and hectare based off wool and meat returns. So he said, sorry, he can't join us today. Um, he's had major computer problems. Um, but yeah, there's just something to, to think about in terms of um, some work that's going on at the moment. Uh, we've got one from Greg Nugent um, down here in Wagga. He's asking, how do you find your mixed species cure in hay or silage scenarios? So I'll ask Brent. Yes, haven't done much with the mixed species. Um, we've more been doing the um, the two, like say vetch and wheat and that sort of thing, and haven't had any dramas. Yeah. But um, yeah, keen to explore the uh, the full mixed species. That, that could be quite interesting. I think they'd be probably more likely to be a silage scenario than hay. I think you'd have difficulty with the hay. Thanks, Brent. I think uh, I'll just go through Cole. I think John will have a comment there. So Cole, uh, you're you're spraying out your summer crops now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Over the penalty. Yeah. <laughs> John, the no, savage guru. Let us my know. my comment would be purely and simply that um, the the issue is going to be getting an even drying. So some some foragers will dry quite quickly and be quite brittle when you come and to rake or or handle them. Whereas thicker thicker crops could be quite difficult to dry. Some of the brassicas can have really thick um stems and things like that but if you can take that into account um 
as a mix, I'd go with Brent. I'd agree with Brent. You can make some really good silage out of mixtures. There's no, you know, in fact, you. Some people would argue that a mixture will make a better silage than, say, a pure legume, um, which, you know, with management, that's not true. But um, that would be my only comment. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. Sorry, I just uh, I enjoyed uh, you hypothesising that that some so, or promoting someone's hypothesis and then immediately shutting it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's it's a hangover from the old days when people didn't have the capacity to wilt silage. So legumes made very bad silages and grasses made relatively good silage. But now we can wilt and do the job pretty quickly. We yeah. can avoid that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Look, well, we're we're almost at time. We'll, we've got one last question here from Michael Hopwood. So thank you for everyone who's uh, brought questions in. I mean, it, it is it's a simple one. What does safflower uh, play in the mix? He, then the comment below is, I wouldn't think it's overly or very palatable. So who? Yeah. What what does the what does safflower play in the mix? Yeah, look, I don't think it is terribly pal palatable, um, but it is included in our 12-way mix. And I think Grant Sims has thrown that in uh, purely to uh, as a soil conditioner to bust open uh, mm. hostile subsoils. Excellent. And I've just minimised my whole screen, so <laughs> give me one moment. Apologies. Uh, look, I think we're going to leave it there. Tony, would you like to turn your camera on? I think you're handing over from here. Um, I just want to say a very big thank you to, to our colleagues and panellists here today who have uh, asked questions and then subsequently answered questions. Uh, big thank you to John for, for coming in as a second. Uh, again, we had a few apologies. So uh, if you've got questions about this, maybe ping them into our Facebook group, um, which M Sims has pinned to the top of this chat, and we'll try and get some of uh, our experts uh, to, to get in there and, and field some of those questions, further questions for you. So. Thank you very much again to all of our panellists and we'll hand over to Tony. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, and a huge thank you, as as Tom just said, well, to Tom and to Kayla um, for your excellent um, facilitation throughout the day. Really appreciate that. Um, apart from a couple of technical glitches, which really are out of everybody's control, I think the day's gone off really well. Also a huge thank you to all of our presenters um, and not just for giving up your time today to present, but for the time that you've given up to pull together your papers that are in the forum proceedings um, and to uh, do all our practice runs to make sure that today went off um, as smoothly as it did. And I did mention earlier, but again, also huge thank you to all of our sponsors today, Meat and Livestock Australia, Sheep Connect New South Wales, Proway Livestock Equipment, the Riverina Local Land Services and Animal Health Australia. So without, you know, everybody that's been involved, um, it, you know, it, it, it takes a team to really pull this together. and. And I really appreciate everybody's help. And also, um, last but not least, thank you to everybody who has jumped online from right across the country. It was great to see that we've had people um, across state state borders. And with everything that's going on at the moment, it's really great that you know we can provide this opportunity online for you all to join us and and for us to share our information and and for you guys to you know be able to um, to build your knowledge. So um, a couple of final things. Um, so we mentioned at the start uh, in regards to the Facebook GC Livestock 20 um, closed group. So if you are on Facebook, please look it up um, and apply to join um, and then continue the conversation uh, with our presenters um, and amongst you know, the networks there. Um, so, yeah, it, it's particularly important, as we all know, particularly during these times where people are isolated to really stay in touch with your colleagues. So please make sure to take the time to do that if you are on Facebook and continue that conversation. And also beyond that, you know, um, picking up the phone and chatting to people and just, um, you know, keeping keeping an eye on everybody and, and making sure that everybody's all right. Um, and finally, the last thing that, uh, that I flagged earlier, or Bruce flagged was um, the short survey. So that will pop up uh, in a moment when I finish. And there's only about six questions. And I know everybody 
really doesn't, I say it every year, doesn't like doing surveys, but um, they're pretty straightforward. It's just really select um, what rating. Um, and so if you could take the time to do that, that just helps us with our feedback and, um, and looking to improve going forward. So thanks again, everybody for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, um, stay safe and look forward to seeing you um, in the future. Thank you.